Um, so, there is a biblical basis um, for integrity. And if we look at integrity, it's being honest and having strong moral principles and moral uprightness. And uh, the Bible says, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope, Lord, is in you. And whoever walks in integrity walks securely. Uh, in Mark, people came to Jesus and said, Teacher, I, we know that you are a man of integrity. They could tell by the way he lived that he had integrity. Um, Job was commended by God to Satan when he is a man of integrity here. Uh, anyway, in 2 in Corinthians, it says, Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially in our relationship with you, with integrity and godly sincerity. So integrity is important. And being a scientist, I have doctorates in both chemistry and in computer and information science, so it's important for me to look at integrity. Um, in Obama's speech to the National Academy of Science um, in 2013, he said, what is so necessary for us to continue our scientific advance and, and then a fidelity to facts and truth, a willingness to follow where the evidence leads. Oh, I wish that were true. <laughs> We've got to make sure that we are supporting the idea that we are not subject to politics, that they're not skewed by an agenda, that, as I said before, we make sure that we go where the evidence leads us. Amen. <laughs> Let, let's go where evidence leads. Um, you know, the, the um, science uh, as we don't know it is not science. Ever stop to think about that? So in all kinds of scenarios, the origin of life might have, might have come about by, that's not science. Anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of speculation nowadays on PBS and elsewhere on the multi-universe, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But that's not science. There's no evidence for it. So anyway, are speculative scenarios science? For me, it's very important. Almost everything I learned um, in the American Chemical Society, from molecules to man, you had organic molecules that developed and eventually led all the way up to man and by just undirected natural processes through chemical evolution and biological evolution. But all the chemical evolutionary scenarios that I learned in my first degree in chemistry have been debunked by science. They're not true. Um, there's a PBS program entitled What Darwin Never Knew. It's a good example of a non-explanation. There is one little part at minute 39 that talks about a gene modification that changes the color of a mouse. That's the only, uh, only thing that is, uh, has to do directly with the modification of, of the genome. Uh, all the other evidence involved turning on and off pre-existing genes. So what, that's like saying when I turn on a light switch, oh, I created electricity, or I created a light. No, all I did was turn on or off something that was already there. And that's what that whole program, two hour program was all about. Uh, no new information, no source of new information was presented at all in that whole program, except for that one minor mouse coloration, <laughs> and that was it. Um, they spent probably 15 minutes on that two-hour program talking about the tectolic. They were looking for the transition between fish and tetrapods, four-limbed creatures. And when they found it, they said, that proves evolution's true because we were looking for it and we found it, the transitional form. This fish looks like it has fins that could be used for legs, almost a tetrapod four-limbed creature. Um, but then it goes on to say, 
the genes needed to make the arms and legs were already being carried around in this prehistoric fish. <laughs> the genes are already there. All they were is switched on or off. So it didn't create anything new, even according to their program. Um, but two years later, there's a nature publication that identified a fully formed tetrapod that, that, that was dated millions of years older than the tectolic. So the tectolic could not have been the transitional form between fish and tetrapods. It could not have been because there are fully formed tetrapods that are older. OK? Anyway. Um, an interesting observation. Biological functionality is turning out to be much more highly specified and precise than we had originally envisioned. Biology is really an, a science of engineering where constraints and biofunctionality are extreme to the point that nearly every molecule, molecular interaction is remarkably precise and tightly controlled. Molecular biology is like a jigsaw puzzle where each piece must fit precisely, specifically, into the shape with other pieces around it. And what happens is, as scientists peel back layers to find something that, oh, maybe we can understand it better, what happens is it opens up cans of worms that makes it more complex and increases the complexity rather than make it simpler and easier to understand. Uh, Phil Skell, a member of the National Academy of Science, writes that Darwinian evolution, whatever its other virtues, does not provide a fruitful heuristic for experimental biology. It simply doesn't. There are many other things. This is a very interesting graph that was supposed to be an illustration of how evolution works. At the very left-hand side, we have the origination of the first cell. That split, you don't have to read this, by the way, that split into other uh, categories and uh, ultimately formed all of the current day Phyla. But what's interesting to me about this whole thing, the black portions of this are fossils that have been found. Notice any transitional fossils in this chart that's supposed to illustrate how evolution works? On any of the things here, there aren't any. The fossils appear fu fully formed, and they stay constant. They don't morph into something different. They stay constant until they either go, they, they go extinct or they remain to the present day. You don't see fossil evidence for things morphing into something different. And this was supposed to show evolution. They stopped showing this, by the way, <laughs> because it doesn't show evolution. It shows that there's a lack of evolution. Anyway, uh, on the other hand, the Bible says everything was reproducing according to its kind. Uh, and one of the scientists uh, says most of the animal phyla that are represented in the fossil record first appeared fully formed in the Cambrian. The Cambrian is the very oldest layer of rock that contains any fossils. And it says most of the animals appeared fully formed suddenly. Interesting. No predecessors. The fossil record is therefore of no help with respect to the origin and early diversification of various animal phyla. But yet that's, of course, what is, is talked about all the time. Richard Dawkins, a very strong evolutionary uh, proponent, says, concerning the invertebrates, it's as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. That's Richard Dawkins saying that. They just suddenly appeared. Wow, isn't that amazing? Um, 
But the fossil record, on the other hand, does support creation with a multitude of life in the very oldest fossil-bearing rocks and the fixity of species over eons of time uh, with no transitional forms that have been verified, although many have been claimed, like the tectolic, for example, was claimed for, it probably still is claimed, but uh, even though there was something that is older that couldn't have been. Here's a real interesting thing. When I was in um, uh, London, I went to the British Museum of Natural History, and they had uh, a cast of the Latoli footprints, and they had statues of these uh, uh, prehistoric looking uh, hominids, very hairy, very ape-like, walking along the Latoli plain. And those be beings there left footprints that looked like that. And what is very intriguing about that is that they look so human-like, the footprints, that some scientists had a hard time believing that they were made by Australopithecus uh, africanus, which is Lucy's species, the only human ancestor known to live at that time. And the footprints are indistinguishable from those of modern humans. Indistinguishable. You get that? So why do you, they show them hunched over, hairy, walking along the plain? Because they were dated 3.7 million years ago, and modern humans didn't live then. So therefore, they must have been ape-like. That's their conclusion. And they build stories around, not around the evidence, <laughs> they base the, the, the stories on their pre presuppositions rather than why, I mean, obviously, if that's true, feet evolve first, right? Because the feet are fully human, modern, matching modern humans, even though their bodies are still hunched over and hairy and all kinds of other things looking very much like apes. Um, there's a really good famous one, Nebraska man. They had a family and a fire and everything else. They found out later after more investigation that all of this stuff was based on a single tooth. And that tooth turned out to be a tooth of a pig. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. It, they're looking for, a, for some missing link between animals and human beings. So whenever they can get something that they can claim as a missing link, they, they do so. And there are many other cases, but that's probably one of the more, more famous ones. Um, there was an article that was published in the journal Science, the premier journal of scientific endeavors. The title was Defeating Creationism in the Courtroom but Not in the Classroom. And they were lamenting the fact that only 28% of biology teachers in high school teach evolution like they should. And they had a solution to it. Their solution was we recommend that those who cannot accept evolution as a matter of faith to pursue other careers. You don't have to accept evolution on the basis of evidence. You have to accept it as a matter of faith. And if you can't, you don't belong as a science teacher. That's what the journal Science published. And they refused to publish my rebuttal to that. That's available on my website, by the way. Um, my website is 4im.org. Uh, the PDF of this talk is also on there that uh, you can get that anytime. I put it on this afternoon. But anyway, um, such the statements as this really destroy the credibility of science. Because if evolution has to be accepted as a matter of faith, what's the purpose of evidence? And, um, you know, I think, and, and part of this whole problem, and there's uh, some brochures in the back and on my website that talk about um, ussci.info has some information on how this kind of stance has affected our national security. Think about it. This country was established on Judeo-Christian principles. 
What's the first thing that happens when you get into science? Everything happened by undirected natural processes through the evolutionary process, and you're just stupid if you believe in God. Well, how many Christians do you think there are that would like to pursue a field of study that sought to demolish their core beliefs? Very few. Consequently, not very many strong Christians go into science because of what they try to push over into their minds. Therefore, our country is suffering because we are falling behind in math and science because the Christians are not going to school in science. And what I found in my talks around the world uh, is that Christians tend to be scientifically illiterate because they're afraid of what they'll find out. And I keep telling people, no, don't be afraid. <laughs> Real science supports the biblical stances in many, many cases a whole lot better than the artificial scenarios that are portrayed as science. There was a uh, publication last uh, November, or October called Does Evolutionary Theory Need a Rethink? People are starting to realize evolutionary theory doesn't work. And more and more people are, are recognizing that. The number of biologists calling for a change in how evolution is conceptualized is growing rapidly. Strong support comes from allied disciplines, particularly the developmental biology, but also genomics and epigenetics, and we won't get into all those things, ecology and social sciences. We contend that evolutionary biology needs revision if it is to benefit fully from these other disciplines. The data supporting our position grows stronger every day. And they say, yet, the mere mention of the extended evolutionary synthesis uh, often evokes an emotional, even hostile reaction among evolutionary biologists. And the British Royal Society just published this month a more detailed uh, stance on the extended evolutionary synthesis, which is what they recommend now to replace Darwinism, because more and more scientists, literally thousands of scientists, are acknowledging Darwinism doesn't work. It's dead. It just hasn't been buried yet. <laughs> but that evokes emotional or even hostile reaction among the evolutionary biologists. So I don't know how long it's going to take, but it will happen. <laughs> they just have to big post pins on your nose or something. I don't know. Anyway, going to a different topic here. <laughs> uh, the origin of mass and energy is unknown to science. Um, there's all kinds of scenarios that have been proposed. Uh, one, of, one of the scenarios is there's an oscillating universe. The current expansion of our universe started with the Big Bang, and eventually gravity will slow it down and start to contract, and then it'll be a big crunch, and then it'll start all over again, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, forever. It's called the oscillating universe. A couple of big problems with that. One of them is that um, it will violate the second law of thermodynamics, which said entropy or randomness is continually increasing. If something has existed forever, it would be totally run down. There would be no work being done. It would be dead. That's a law, scientific law, that always has been observed to happen. Uh, the other problem is that the universe is expanding at a rate that's faster than the escape velocity, and therefore it can't slow down. And that puzzles people, so therefore they say, well, it's probably driven by dark energy, things that we can't see, but it must be something is inserting energy into this to make it expand faster. Uh, well, the Bible talks about God stretching out the heavens, and you know, I don't know if that's what he's doing there, but anyway. Uh, another scenario that's often portrayed for the origin of mass and energy of the universe is you have a uh, vacuum, nothing, absolutely nothing. And inside that vacuum, you have quantum fluctuations that suddenly pop out of it 
the mass and energy of the universe. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. The more common view nowadays is that there are whole bunches of other universes out there. And at some point in the distant past, two of those universes collided to produce our universe. We have colliding universes. But it has been estimated that in order to see the fine tuning that we see in our universe, you would need at least 10 to the 500th universes, at least, in order to have a reasonable hope of getting the fine tuning that we see in our universe. Uh, 10 to the 500 is 1 followed by 500 zeros. There's only 10 to the 80th, 1 followed by 80 zeros, atoms in the entire universe. So that number is so far beyond what we can even imagine that it's not hardly worth speaking about. But the other thing that's troublesome about the multi-universe, the universe, by definition, is everything there is. If there is multiple universes, there are multiple everything there is, which doesn't make any sense grammatically nor logically. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the way it goes. The other thing that makes it hard is that we can only see things and study things in our universe. We cannot study anything outside of our universe. So even if it were true that there are other, other universes, they would be outside of our scientific investigation and therefore would not be science to us. Um, then another possibility is that there's some kind of an infinite energy being that converts mass or otherwise supernaturally creates the universe. Hmm, does that sound familiar? Yeah, you ever stop to think about when God said, let there be the mass and energy of the universe? The equivalent energy was released to say that when it says the, the word of the Lord is powerful. 520 million, trillion, 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 trillion atomic bombs worth of energy were released when he said that in order to create the mass and energy of this universe. That's a lot of energy. So when the Bible says the word of the Lord is powerful, you can believe it. Anyway, all four of these... Uh, scenarios have unprovable, uh, unverifiable, unfalsifiable assumptions, and they're not bound by known science. They're all belief systems. They're philosophical or theological belief systems. I can't prove to you that the God of the Bible is the one who did it, but it certainly would satisfy the, uh, the criteria for doing so if, if what I believe about God is true. Uh, but it is no more scientific to believe in a natural scenario than to believe in a supernatural scenario since known science can't account for the origin. And most of the scenarios violate the conservation of mass and energy or increasing entropy. The only one that doesn't is the creation scenario because the energy that was used to produce this universe came from God. That's what it says. By his word, the universe was created. That's what the Bible says. So that, that doesn't violate any known scientific laws even. It just took some of his infinite energy and used that to create the mass and energy of the universe. No problem. He knows how to do that. Anyway. But the fine-tuned nature of the universe is scientifically knowable and studyable. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are this constants for the strong and weak nuclear forces, and electromagnetic and gravitational forces, the ratio of forces, and electron-proton masses, properties of neutrons, all of these things are very critical, as are the expansion rate, mass, and density of the universe. Um, the Earth's orbit and tilt and rotation, magnetic field, atmosphere, and composition are all life critical. If any of these things were just a little tiny bit different, there would not be life. Um, Stephen Hawking said, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, Penrose, Roger Penrose, said that an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd is the precision needed to set the universe on its course in order for us to develop the way we have. I, can't, I work with big numbers. I can't even imagine how big that is. Remember, there are only 10 to the 80th atoms in the entire universe. 10 to the 123rd is a 1 with 123 zeros after it. 10 to the 10 to the 123rd is a 1 with 10 to the 123 zeros after it, which you can't even write with all the atoms in the universe. So anyway, um, there is for me powerful evidence that there's something going on behind it all. It seems to me that somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming, so says uh, physicist Paul Davies. Um, Atheist Fred Hoyle writes, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics. He was an atheist, but he could recognize, hey, something's going on here that, that defies uh, scientific explanation. If we nudge one of these constants just a few percent, there's no carbon, no life, not even any chemistry, no complexity at all. Just a little bit. Um, astrophysicist Hugh Ross uh, has a list of um, uh, parameters that were taken from 650 astronomical and astrophysical research papers and has 501 parameters in it. And the probability of all of those parameters being in the range that would support life the probability of any place in the universe having all those characteristics is one part in 10 to the 311th power, the one with 311 zeros after it. Um, so it really is quite amazing that we have life. But the Bible clearly says that he who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but he formed it to be inhabited. So it's no big surprise to a Bible-believing Christian that the earth supports life. Because that's, what, that's how God created it. So it's no big surprise. Um, but to get around some of the, uh, the problems that, and make excuses for the, uh, uh, the fine-tuning because we know that we have life on this planet, therefore our universe must be one of multiple other universes. I talked about that a little bit before. And so uh, the idea here is that all you really need is gravity and you'll create the universe. And basically, uh, that's nonsense. <laughs> but uh, uh, the laws of physics are such that uh, uh, it just really uh, it cannot work the way some people think it could. There's a very interesting book that I read a few years ago written by Victor Stenger called God, The Failed Hypothesis. He made some very interesting um, statements in it. He said, for example, a plausible scientific model need not be proven correct, just not proven incorrect. I'm not sure what kind of science he goes with, but, uh, uh, and, he, and then he goes on later on, he says, the hypothesis of a god is falsified by the absence of data, which is contrary to what he just got done saying. Um, and then he says, theists who argue that the universe is finely tuned to earthly life have the burden of proving that no other form of life is possible in every conceivable universe that has different physical parameters. 
How are you going to do that? Every conceivable universe you have to prove scientifically that it's impossible to have life on it. That's not science. <laughs> uh, and he, he goes on all kinds of other things that uh, he also says something that is laughable to me as a, uh, as a scientist. Uh, well understood physical and chemical processes are sufficient to account for the observed interaction between the various parts of living organisms. Complete nonsense. We'll talk a little bit about that as we get into information in life. But that's complete hooey. Uh, so, the origin of life was supposedly done in some warm little pool that created, used the water and hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and nitrogen to form the various components, um, which formed higher level components, which ultimately worked their way to form DNA and proteins and a membrane and ultimately a cell. Ooh, isn't that wonderful? So that's chemical. Uh, once it forms a cell, then you can start biological evolution, supposedly. But until then, it's classified as chemical evolution. There was a uh, scientist, uh, Dean Kenyon, who wrote a book called Biochemical Predestination, saying this stuff is inevitable. And we still believe that because we're looking when we ever we land on another planet or moon or whatever, looking for life. Because we have life here, it must be elsewhere also. It's inevitable. They found water on Mars, oh, then there must be life. There's a big difference between water and life. Anyway, um, chemical evolution is broadly regarded as a highly plausible scenario for imagining an how life on Earth might have begun. What has emerged over the last three decades is an alternative scenario which is characterized by destruction and not the synthesis of life. The undirected flow of energy through a primordial atmosphere and ocean is at present a woefully inadequate explanation for the incredible complexity associated with even the simplest living organisms. It just it's non-scientific to believe those things. Um, origin of life. I wrote a, a paper, peer-reviewed paper, uh, that was uh, called "What Might a Protocell's Minimum Genome Be Like?" And um, uh, in that paper, I, I said basically, in order for a protocell, this is the, the cell before it became alive. Uh, it would have to be able to reproduce, and it would have to do that reliably and be have evolvabil uh, evolvability, and have to be replicable. Uh, but that would involve computer control, cybernetic control. Chemical metabolic networks are needed to admit and process the fuel and harness the energy for growth, reproduction, and manufacturing. Those are the requirements. Now, I didn't say uh, the, the title of the paper was what might be a protocell's minimum genome. I didn't specify what that would be, but I just laid out the requirements that there would have to be in order for that to happen. And the requirements that I laid out have not ever been come close to in reality, nor will there, will there ever be. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, the... Um, Origin of life remains one of the most vexing issues in chemistry, biology, and philosophy. Because there's lots of philosophy out there that poses a science when it comes to the origin of life. Um, the challenge, as I wrote in my book in 2009, the challenge for an undirected origin of a such, such a cybernetic, that's a computer-controlled, complex interacting computer system, 
is the need to demonstrate that the rules, laws, and theories that govern electronic computer computing systems and information don't apply to the even more complex digital information systems that are in living organisms. In the 100 trillion cells of your body, every single cell has literally millions of real computers and real computer programs. Every process that's biological is controlled by the processing of digital information. And I have two peer-reviewed papers in which I assert biology is not a physical science like chemistry and physics. Biology is an information science because it's the information science that controls the chemistry and physics that are used by life. And I verify that in my Programming of Life book as well. If we look at the probabilities of forming uh, things that will match uh, some of the life components, for example, the probability of forming a protein has been calculated as one part in 10 to the 175. That's a one with 175 zeros after it. Um, that would be equivalent to run, run, winning the California Super Lotto 23 times in a row, buying one ticket each time. Uh, in case you're interested. Uh, Fred Hoyle's calculation of the probability of forming the enzymes that are required by life is one part in 10 to the 40,000th power. That's a one with 40,000 zeros after it. That would be like winning this California Super Lotto every Wednesday and Saturday for 50 years every time, buying one ticket each time. Not likely to happen. And uh, the probability of finding a, forming a self-replicating cell is one part in 10 to the 340,000th, 40 millionth power, which is not likely at all. <laughs> uh, some interesting observations. None of the papers that were published in the Journal of Molecular Evolution, the Journal of Molecular Evolution should describe how molecules evolve into life, chemical evolution. But none of the papers ever published in it from 1971 on has ever proposed a detailed model by which complex biochemical system might have been produced in a gradual, step-by-step -step Darwinian fashion. I find that intriguing. The level of a complexity that's revealed at the molecular level have further strained the concept of random assembly. And it's hard to see how the chemicals could have formed the complicated nucleotides that are needed by life. Many of you may not realize uh, what intelligent design is um, and how it differs from creationism, but intelligent design holds that uh, certain features of the universe and living things are best explained by an intelligent cause and not by some undirected process such as natural selection. Um, the fact that it's compatible with what the Bible teaches doesn't make it religious. Uh, in fact, in my book, I, I point out that until no one science can demonstrate feasible scenarios for the universe's fine tuning and the informational features that are found in life, arising by undirected nature, science must recognize that intelligence is the only scientifically feasible source, making intelligent design a certainty based on known science. So based on known science, intelligent design is certain. Now you can speculate, maybe that's not true, but we know that intelligence can produce all kinds of things that are very improbable um, and make them, make them work. But anyway, God is not connected with any uh, theology. It's not a required belief. Um, in fact, atheist Fred Hoyle said, the intelligence which in assembled the enzymes did not itself contain them, which by no, need, no means need be God, however. <laughs> uh, he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God, but he recognized that this, this is designed. 
So in his mind, the design came from some aliens. And we won't get into what he believed about that, but that's what he believed. Uh, currently, science is restric uh, restricted to undirected natural processes, and there, therefore you're not even con allowed to consider intelligence or design or purpose. Um, but in fact, intelligent design makes better sense and better science. Uh, the vestigial organs, uh, there used to be 180 organs that were supposedly left over from the evolutionary process. Purposes have been found for every, every single one of those. Um, it used to be thought that 98% uh, plus of the DNA was junk DNA because less than 2% of it coded for proteins. The rest was just junk. And for 30 years, it was declared to be junk until a couple of years ago, accumulation of 30 scientific papers of hundreds of scientists on many different nations published uh, a bunch of papers verifying that 80% of the DNA has known function. It's not junk. God don't make junk. Anyway. Uh, but the best explanation for the observations, if we limit our uh, science to a predetermined acceptable explanation, kind of begs the question, what if there is no natural explanation for it? Then what? We're going to waste our time and money and resources and everything else pursuing things that don't exist. Um, the explanation of any phenomenon should take, make as few assumptions as possible, eliminating those that make no difference in the observable predictions in the explanatory hypothesis or theory. Um, that's Occam's razor. There have been a lot of court rulings on belief systems. The Supreme Court has determined, for example, that Implications of material alone do not make a religion, even if they coincide or harmonize with the tenets of some or all religions. So intelligent people say intelligent design is just creationism. It's not. It doesn't have anything to say directly about God or who, who the designer is, because that would be scientifically unknowable. We can determine scientifically that there was design, but we cannot determine scientifically that it was the God of the Bible, for example. Okay. Um, in 1961, uh, the Supreme Court said, among the religions of this world which do not teach what would generally be considered a belief in the existence of God are, among others, secular humanism, which is the religion of our secular school system. Um, in an appellate decision, it was ruled that atheism is a religion. It's a belief system. Um, and the group that he was in was religious in nature, even though it expressly rejected the belief in a supreme being. Atheism is a religion. So says the courts. Um, 1961, the Supreme Court said, religious beliefs are based upon a faith to which all else is subordinate. Some believe in a purely personal God and others as a way of life. If you believe that everything arose by undirected natural processes, that's your religion. That's what, it, that's what the court says. Everything else is subserv subservient to that belief. An example of some twisting of facts that affected me personally. Uh, Barbara Forrest, uh, uh, an atheist uh, type of person who uh, works for the National Center for Science Education, characterized me, one of the signers of the Louisiana uh, statute of supporting the teaching of the, uh, down, the things that evolution doesn't, that it fails in. And so she ca characterized me as being an ID apologist, an intelligent design apologist, with a background in computer programming. Forget the fact that I have two PhDs. It doesn't matter. I'm a programmer. 
And Eugenia Scott also says, I'm a programmer. I never had the title programmer. But anyway, they, they, they forget about that. On the other hand, Larry Moran at the University of Toronto uh, was writing about one of my books, and he said he has several common characteristics of intelligent design creationist proponents, multiple PhDs. I'm really intrigued by the fact that so many idiots have more than one PhD, because I hang out with real scientists all the time, and none of them has ever felt the need to be a graduate student more than once in their life. Oh, I see. I'm not a real scientist because I have two PhDs. Okay. Anyway, uh, if they can't come at what they don't believe in one way, they'll try it by just throwing mud. <laughs> um, the International um, Committee on uh, the Global Warming was very interesting. Uh, the, Heidel the Heidelberg appeal to that had 4,000 signatures, including 62 Nobel Prize winners. Uh, the Oregon petition had 31,000 accredited scientists. The Manhattan Declaration had 600 research climatologists. The petition to the United Nations had 100 geoscientists. And the statement from the American Physical Society had 150 physical scientists. The UN, UN climate scientists speak out on global warming, 700 of them. Many previously were involved with the IPCC. And all of them are critical of the notion of man-made global warming. But the consensus is human beings are the cause of global warming. That's the consensus. That's the political consensus, and you better kowtow to that. But there, um, in order to sign up to be part of uh, the IPCC in the charter, it says to, the, the charter had to assess the risk of human-induced climate change. So if you wanted to get in on the money and other, everything else that goes with it, you better be able to show that humans Mark the cause. Otherwise, you're not going to get funded. Um, but there are 53 authors and five reviewers, and those are all that can be said to explicitly support the claim of significant human influence on climate. Only 53 and five reviewers. Interesting. From the talk and the political talk. You would think every scientist believes in human engineered global warming. Not so. Um, here's a chart of the global warming over the last 17 years. And it has gone up and down as it normally does. But the models are shown here. The models show the increase in temperature going off the chart the actual temperature is down here by a couple of different measurements. So it isn't at all settled science. People try to make it that way, but it isn't. It's political. A couple more things that are, that are involved with uh, science and integrity in science. Um, in 1997, a US law mandated that there, there was a registry of clinical trials that was uh, mandated. And it was very interesting because they found in a study that in a sample of 55 large trials testing heart disease treatments, 57% of those published before 2000 reported positive effects after this mandate came in requiring that they make uh, report the, the registration of the results. Afterwards, it plummeted to 8%, which is kind of interesting. Um, there was a case against scholarly consensus. Consensus science is fairly popular nowadays, but the um, uh, 
American Psychological Association uh, basically concluded uh, after some arm twisting and things that, uh, oh, it's okay to torture people to get information out of them. <laughs> hmm, interesting. Uh, but this, this case is a particularly disturbing example of a problem throughout the social sciences, the crafting of false consensus statements to promote ide ideological or political goals. False consensus does great uh, and sometimes irreparable damage to science. In studies of Wikipedia, they discovered that controversial science topics are edited a lot more than normal topics. In fact, uh, I'm a member of an intelligent design group, and people have said that they posted something to correct mistakes, and within seconds, it reverts back to what it used to be. <laughs> they have people that are evidently looking, oh, to change it back immediately. But basically, Wikipedia uh, entries on, on politically controversial topics uh, tend to be unreliable due to information sabotage uh, and all this stuff tarnishes the integrity uh, of science. Uh, there was recently a um, uh, California State University Northridge scientist who had a peer-reviewed paper published indicating that uh, uh, found a triceratops dinosaur fossil that had soft tissue in the bones. And his conclusion was it must be just a few thousand years old rather than millions of years old. And uh, that was published in a peer review science journal. But the uh, university that uh, he belonged to said, we're not going to tolerate your religion in this department. And they fired him. Because basically he was saying that dinosaurs are, are not nearly as old as what science tells us they were. Anyway, there have been lots and lots of scientific papers that have been retracted. Um, at near the end of 2013, um, there were over 511 papers retracted in that year. And um, just this month, it said 64 more papers were retracted for fake reviews from Stringer, Springer Journal. That's a, that's a premier science public, publication uh, outfit. Uh, there have been 1,500 papers retracted overall since 2012. People publish false findings, faked findings, whatever. When people find out about it, they're retracted. Um, scientific look at bad science. 2% uh, of the scientists that were uh, studied admitted to having fabricated, falsified, or modified data or results at least once, and many, as many as a third convinced to a variety of other questionable research practices, including dropping data points based on a gut feeling. That doesn't look right, so I'm just uh, ignore that one or changing the design methodology or results of a study in response to peer, uh, to pr pressures from source funding. Cigarette smoking doesn't do any harm. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, many scientists blame the increase in competition for academic jobs and research funding combined with a publisher perish type of culture that causes this bad science to be published without really any scientific basis. Um, one researcher wrote uh, in Nature that when his team tried to reproduce 53 landmark cancer studies, should be pretty important, they could only replicate six. So six out of 53 were the ones that were really scientific. The others weren't. That's kind of scary. 
Uh, social sciences uh, suffer from severe publication bias because things that don't show positive results don't get published. If you study something and it doesn't show what you expected it to show, you don't publish it. Rather than publishing it saying, this is what I found, it doesn't work. <laughs> Which is what would be reasonable. If you spend some time studying something and it doesn't work, you should be able to publish that as it doesn't work. So don't try this, it won't work. Um, but science really is really poisoned by only hearing about successes. Then there's Common Core. Um, Common Core Educational Program. It takes from parents their primary right regarding the education of their children. It frustrates the purpose of education with the goal of making college and career ready students. Um, it has standardized teaching and testing and it seeks to create a massive machine of education. Common Core standards require children's personal information to be provided into a database that can be expected to sell or share with, to unspecified companies. Kind of scary. It has devastating impact on literary study and analytical thinking. Uh, for example, one of the Common Core civics assignment is to revise the Constitution's outdated Bill of Rights. Obviously that's obsolete. Let's write a better one. Now, I have a couple minutes, so let me just talk a little bit about my favorite topic, computers in life. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, Richard Dawkins says, the machine code of a genes is uncannily computer-like. Apart from differences in jargon, the pages of a molecular biology journal might be interchanged with those of a computer engineering journal. Interesting. Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, said, human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. So if I said, the Windows 8 operating system that's running on this computer just arose by undirected natural processes through an evolutionary process, how many of you would say, yeah, I believe that? No. It took years of intelligent people writing software for that to happen. Uh, a very, very important thing happened uh, back in 2010. Craig Ventner, biologist, his group extracted the DNA from one type of bacterium and they cobbled together a strand of DNA that matched a different type of bacterium. They inserted that manufactured DNA into that cell whose DNA was extracted, did some other operations, and that cell became alive taking on the characteristics of the injected DNA. Now what that proved, well, Greg Ventner said, life is basically the result of an information process, a software process. Our genetic code is our software. Now that software that they injected was read by the computer hardware that was already in that cell. They didn't replace that. So there's, he proved experimentally the existence of computer hardware and software in everything that is alive, which is something I've been saying for many years. And he verified it experimentally. So it, in the statement that uh, the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like, no, 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 it is computer code. It's not just like computer code, it is computer code. Richard Dawkins is like a human being. <laughs> no, anyway, we'll go on. So what, what is a computer? Uh, the people look at a computer, well this is a computer obviously, it's an electronic computer. But that's not the only kind of computer there is. Uh, all you really need for a computer is to have input or embedded data, 
memory and internal transfer uh, program com to tell it, tell it what, what to do, processing capability, and the capability to pr produce meaningful output. And biological computers have that, electronic computers have that, and that mechanical computer that you saw on the previous slide also did that. Um, but it's important to realize that every single protein of the 100,000 proteins that are generated by your body, every single one of them is the result of the execution of a real computer program. There are millions of real computer programs in every cell. And there are 100 trillion cells in your body. That's a lot of computer programs. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things in my book. I won't go into them now because there's not time. But these things require scientific explanations. Like, for example, how did nature write the prescriptive programs needed to organize life's metabolism? You have this dead material. How did it know enough to write the programs to do metabolism? Because metabolism is controlled by computer in, the, in life cells and so forth down the line, a whole bunch of it. How did it solve the problems and write the programs? Uh, how did it have the uh, uh, generating messages and encryption and just all kinds of stuff that life's complexity is involved with? Here's a good one. Every complex program in computer science requires what's called top-down design and, and implementation. You design the thing at the top level, you break it down in further and further, and finally you write the code at the very bottom. That's not the way supposedly it happens in life. In life, supposedly, it starts at the very bottom and works its way up. You modify the programs at the very lowest level. By the way, evolution says you have an existing organism that has existing computer programs in it, those computer programs are randomly changed by random changes in your computer programs, and they produce better computer programs. Oh well, yeah? Since when can that happen? Anyway. Um, speculation and integrity in science, um, it's, it's important for, for scientists to be able to speculate things to, so that they can test them out, see if they work. But we need to as science needs to be able to avoid proclaiming the speculations as some sort of scientific truth. You see it all the time. Well, this, this man-made experimental result that, that does some very th weird things on pure elements and very carefully controlled elements, well, maybe that's what happened for the origination of life. Well, that's a Computer, it's a complete controlled experiment that you're doing. It has nothing to do with the origin of life. It's a very interesting chemical experiment. Nothing to do at all with the origin of life. And consequently, um, if you proclaim that to the world, they might believe it, <laughs> which is, I think, a mistake. The argument that we don't know yet how this feature can arise by undirected natural processes, but we will someday, is not a scientific statement. It is a faith statement based on naturalism of the gaps uh, dogma, which has no more scientific validity than the appeal to the god of the gaps as an explanation for complex systems. So if you say, I don't know how this happened, but we will someday, that's not science. That's faith in scientism. Anyway. So I have a website, and I've had it for many years, called Science Integrity, where I try to expose the unsubstantiated scientific claims. And I've written several books, and a lot of them are out there that you're welcome to get. By the way, if you buy one of my books for five bucks, You'll get a, a free DVD of the new Programming of Life 2 and Programming of Life 1 on one DVD. So it's free. Uh, OK, there it is. That's it.
The end. Thank you, Don. Uh, very good presentation. We're going to take some time for Q&A. And uh, while you think of some questions you want to ask Don, uh, we're going to take a free will offering to cover some of the expenses of putting on this ministry. So if you like to participate in that, you're welcome to do that. And uh, we'll, I'll talk about a little bit about the books and pamphlets in the back later on, because that's another way we uh, raise funds for the ministry. Um, so questions that you may have. I'm going to go Don. around with the uh, mic so yeah. that people can. Questions. Everybody understood everything perfectly. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Here. I, I got one. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait a second. Hang, hang on so we can record it. I just have one as you were talking. Um, you talked about Wikipedia being changed in a nanosecond and all of this. <laughs> the thought came into my mind, you know, we, we're seeing our world changing rapidly toward the secular side. Mm -hmm. Uh, I hope I can connect the dots here, but you take Target, which is now wanting to do with gender neutral toy sections, clothing sections, whatever. The thought comes into my mind, we've got Christians out there with millions and billions of dollars. Why isn't there a Christian alternative? So to line that up, you have the world who has their science journal, they have their sites, we have the Christian Research Institute, we have the Christian this, the Christian that. Has there been any effort to try to tie you guys together so that we Christians can have a source to go to that when the topic comes up, we have a resource that can go to, pull it out and, you know. Uh, there are a few things like that, but um, basically what happens, once you declare yourself to be a Christian, you're basically shunned from the scientific community. Right. And, and they, they, they don't, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and maybe that, that could be done. There, there are some that, that, uh, that do that. And particularly in the intelligent design community, there are many different uh, biocomplexity and other magazines and journals that, that, that do that sort of thing. Uh, but um, one of the differences with intelligent design is they don't stress uh, belief in uh, God or they don't proclaim the Bible or things like that. And when I'm talking on intelligent design or science to a secular environment, I, I don't um, talk evangelically. I just present the science facts because the science facts just scream out, there's a creator. Uh, a Christian professor invited me over to uh, to Hong Kong, for example, to do a talk on intelligent design, and I did. And afterwards, he emailed me saying one of the graduate students that heard my lecture came up to him afterwards saying, what's this design about? Who did the design? And the professor led him to Christ and emailed me to inform him. Nor normally, I don't see the results of things like that. But I, I believe that, you know, if you seek, you will find. And, and uh, what I try to do to the uh, secular world is to break up their intellectual barriers that they've erected that prevent them from seeking. Because if you know there's something out there, I mean, you're a scientist, you'll, you'll try to seek it. Anyway. Other questions? Yeah, let me. And uh, you, you make a point about other organizations that can, uh, you know, are funded to address some of the issues. There are very strong creation organizations, you know, Answers in Genesis, uh, ICR, right. and, and they do provide some good they answers do, to yeah. questions. There are some good, they have a few, uh, well, the, the apologetic symposium, uh, symposium and conference that are coming up in September down Park, Park Ridge. Yeah, global warming. I mean, is it authentic? Or is Al Gore, did he catch another football and expects to make a touchdown and <laughs> add more millions of bucks? I mean, I'm not saying uh, I believe Al Gore, but... Yeah, well... Is, back, is, back, is back global when he warming the, the natural result of um, um, uh, the well, Ice Age? 
the global warming, there have been all kinds of climate changes throughout history, and that's, that's verifiable. Uh, but, but the big issue is, is it caused by human beings? And, and that, there is no evidence that, the real, real, real evidence that there is. Okay. And, and the idea, for example, that carbon dioxide is a pollutant. No, it isn't. It's plant food. That's, that's what plants take in to produce oxygen. <laughs> you know, anyway. So, anyway. It, it, before I take your question, because that, that's one of my hot buttons. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, I did a, an independent analysis of that issue from a scientific point of view. And I determined that, yes, temperature is changing over time. But uh, as Don says, the question that was asked of the scientists is look for man-made causes of global warming. Right. And, and man is such a small fraction of that. The big determinant is solar activity. Solar activity. The solar activity is going down. And you know, we're seeing that the temperature, average temperature is not increasing like their models say it is. Uh, I've written a paper on that. And if you look at my website, my analysis with about 100 different technical paper references are all on there. And it'll show you from a science point of view that what they're proposing is really not good science. He he has well, a different agenda. And I, I liked Al Gore when he was running for president and wanted the recount. And I, I in a computer science, what I said was an Al Gore rhythm is re repeatedly count, rec recounting the ballots until you get the result you want. <laughs> Algorithms are computer, yeah, anyway. Well, Al Gore invented- An Al Gore rhythm, anyway. Al Gore invented the internet too, right? Oh yeah, he did, he invented the internet. Thank this, you, Al Gore. This is not a question, it's a comment that the intelligent design movement or whatever you call it, helped me because they said it's not an argument, science versus religion. Right. It's science versus science. Right. And when you talked about what happened in Hong Kong, that proves right. the point on that. And some would call that it's a one worldview against another worldview. People are making different assumptions. They look at the same evidence, and they just arrive at different conclusions. But because their assumptions are different, based on their own biases. Yeah. And, and we, are, we are biased, too. Sure. We have to admit that. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Ah. So other questions? No. And, and by the way, I, I'm one of those 31,000 scientists that signed that petition. You, you probably did, ah. too. Hi. I'm, I'm a, a home educator. And uh -huh. um, I would like to know, there's so much science out there, and I'd like to be uh, as integral as I can. Do you have any, um, any uh, things that you can help someone like me who's not a scientist to be able to kind of begin kind of peeling away, maybe helping kind of um, bring some of these things to attention? I know coming here tonight is one of them, but what can I do more, I guess, or where can I begin? Uh, well, I have links on my website. My 4im.org has a links page, and you can start there and check various links to ICR and Answers in Genesis and a whole bunch of other things that uh, hopefully will help get you started. And um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff out there of varying quality, uh, but. Uh, Hopefully that'll get going. So um, secular scientists believe that the Ice Age was about three million years ago. Probably. Then, yeah, and then creation scientists believe that it was between four and five thousand. And probably post flood, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> their concept is that. Secular scientists believe that the global warming should be a lot more gradual than what we're seeing, and they 
they, that's the reason why they see it, say it's man-made. I was curious, is that something you believe, or do you not believe in global warming whatsoever? I believe that uh, the global temperatures have changed throughout history uh, and prehistory. <laughs> uh, they, they, they do, climate does change. And uh, there have been times when they've had, uh, you know, a lot of change and times when it has like in the Ice Age, for example. Uh, that was, forget how many degrees, it wasn't that many. It was, you, you know offhand, uh, was that, Heinz was, the Ice Age only like a three, three degree temperature drop or something, so, as something minuscule that you wouldn't think, well, that would cause the Ice Age, but it did. Well, the, actually, one, one of the speakers that's going to come to the uh, creation conference here in uh, September, <clears throat> Michael Ord, he's done an analysis of that, and he has a talk on when the ice age occurred and what the impact is. One major ice age. And uh, good question for him when he comes in uh, September. By the way, I, I do have probably a dozen presentations that are on my 4im.org website that you can watch. Uh, and uh, a lot of printable flyers and things, and you're welcome to pick up the flyers that are out there also that I issue, have a, question. Have a lot of uh, issues. How do evolutionists address the huge probability numbers, or I'd call them <laughs> improbability numbers? Well, they typically say, well, that's very improbable, but we can go back and have lots and lots of time and uh, George Wald, for example, says that um, uh, given enough time, the impossible becomes improbable, <laughs> and the improbable becomes probable, and the probable becomes certain. And that's bogus because if it's impossible, it will not become probable regardless of how much time you have. And then there, and even if you try to use the most old scenario, it doesn't come nearly enough time. Any other questions? If not, we're going to wrap this up, and you can always ask him questions back at the book table there. Uh, it, we're going to show the previous slide, number five, in, in a bit. But anyway, let's uh, thank Don for uh, his presentation and answering the questions.